Hello, my dear patients. So, I am here today for a very special episode just for you. And of course, if you're a patron of the show, you have that episode in advance. Thank you very much for your support. That makes this kind of episode especially possible. And this is a very special one because I am here today at CERN, uh, here in Switzerland, on a site for a very special episode with Kevin Greif that we're going to meet in a moment. But basically, we're going to talk about Kevin, about what they are doing at CERN, what the super collider is, what the ATLAS experiment uh, is that is just on my right. Right now, we're going to see the control room. We're going to uh, also talk about antimatter, what that is and uh, what we know about it. And we're also uh, going to talk about dark matter and what that is and why Kevin is fascinated by that and actually kind of optimistic about dark matter, uh, not discovery, but trying to understand what that is. And also we're going to visit the antimatter factory. So lots of things to do today. Uh, it's going to be the first episode that we do on site with a documentary flavor. So uh, if you like it, please let me know. If you don't like it, also let me know <laughs> so that I know uh, what you would like to see. Uh, if you have ideas for a future episode like that uh, and have, you know, um, ideas on where I could go to uh, to grab some of these episodes, let me know. Even better if you know someone there to introduce me. Uh, so yeah, like I'm very excited about that new format. Uh, and now I am really excited to show you around the CERN campus and talk about and physics and nerdy stuff like with Kevin Kai. Let me show you how to be a good Bayesian. Change your predictions after taking information in. And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing, let's adjust those expectations. Let me show you how to be a good Bayesian. Change calculations after taking fresh data in. Those predictions that your brain is making. Let's get them on a solid foundation. It was 2009 and I was opening for NAS. Predicted they would love us. Hypothesis was wrong. Crowd presented evidence, booing while I rhymed. They'd rather hear the message or New York State of mind. Was it my flow? No, I hardly lacked ability. Rapping with agility, check the probability. Not likely to give up under fierce choleric scrutiny. Refused to stop the show, though their peer review was news to me. Confusing me like the anti-science right. I was dripping like the ice caps. Yes, it was not my night. But I kept it busy in cause the late I'm in is solid Anticipate results with my a priori knowledge So never let a hater shower you with data That tells you you should quit, drop the mic and be like later Two more songs, then like OJ, I was out Saw Nas backstage and thanked him, grabbed my bag and then I bounced Let me show you how to be a good baby and Change your predictions after taking information And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing Let's adjust those expectations Let me show you how to be a good baby and Change calculations after taking fresh data those predictions that your brain is making Let's get them on a solid foundation Felt like I was still a baby when I first learned to be a Bayesian I would find myself So Kevin, welcome to Learning Bayesian Statistics Thank you And uh, thank you a lot for taking the time You're going to show us around the campus today I know it's going to take a lot of time <laughs> and effort So thank you very much in advance Oh, my pleasure uh, and so, so that listeners can get a bit of the idea of who you are, what you do, can you yeah, mainly give us your uh, background story, your origin story? <laughs> How did you end up working in the world of physics, and yeah. particle physics, and how serious of a path uh, was? Yeah, of course. So uh, I guess my journey with physics starts from a pretty young age, um, I remember one of my favorite things to do as a kid was um, come home after school at night and watch like physics documentary series on the television. <laughs> uh, so there's this, there's this famous, um, like, I guess famous um, television series called Nova, 
that uh -huh. was produced when I was a child um, on PBS, which is the public broadcasting service in the United States. And my, I would watch with my family, um, like religiously, every single night. Um, and that is really where my interest in science got started. Um, and in particular, I always found it the best whenever they were talking about fundamental physics. Um, this was the thing that really made me like excited, and like I thought the questions they were asking were so cool and so mind bending. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and so you know, I always knew I was interested in science and in fundamental physics, but it never really struck me as a career path that I pursue mm -hmm. until I made it to undergrad, until my bachelor's studies. Mm -hmm. I actually came in to my bachelor's expecting to be an engineer. Um, and I, that choice was mainly because I knew I had an aptitude for math and science. You know, I was good at these things in school and, um, I thought it was a very practical thing to be, you know, engineering was something that you could get a job, yeah. well paying job, and it would make sense. And I would, I would find it fun. Yeah. Um, but then when I started taking classes, I realized that I found my physics classes so interesting and I found my engineering classes so boring. Um, and then it became obvious that I was doing the wrong thing, that what I really, what really like got my interests, what really got my passion was the more fundamental science. Um, it wasn't questions about how we can make machines do things. It was questions about how the universe works. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I just found the process of science and the things that we've learned about the universe to be so beautiful mm -hmm. and so, so compelling like you would uncover one layer of detail um and then there would just be so many more questions that that layer would bring up mm -hmm. you know I, I loved the way that science like kept unfolding you would just dig deeper and deeper and deeper and there never really seemed to be a bottom yeah um and it's that kind of like eternal it, it was that like continuous pattern of iterating and learning new and new things that i just i, I found it so cool um and so I changed my major. I decided I was going to study physics. Um, and I guess the rest is history. I got involved in the high energy physics group at my undergraduate institution um, and started doing research on, you know, collider physics, the kind mm -hmm. of physics we do here at CERN. Yeah. And loved it. Um, they sent me out here for a summer when I was still an undergraduate. And I did research out here and loved it. Um, I loved the lab. I loved the city. Um, I loved the people. And it was very obvious to me that I should do a PhD. Um, and so, yep, I, I applied for a PhD and, um, and uh, yeah, have been doing that for the last three years and hope to continue doing it until I graduate. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so what's the, um, like, yeah, what are you doing nowadays, basically? How would you define that? Yeah, it's a really good question. So um, I do, you know, the life of a PhD student is, is a lot of different things. The first thing to state is that I'm, I'm still a student. Um, you know, ideally everybody always has the mindset that they're still a student, but especially when you're a PhD student, I, I think you have a lot of leeway to continue trying to learn things. Mm -hmm. So I do spend a lot of time, like even reading textbooks um, and reading papers. I, I do a lot of reading and trying to understand like different ideas within the realm of fundamental science research and how people um, you know, you know, new ideas in the realm of like analyzing collider data. So I would say that's maybe 10% you know, of my time is, is, is trying to like keep learning. Um, but on top of that, you know, the, the rest of your time is dedicated to research. Um, my research is in a few areas. So um, on the operational side, in terms of like the real day to day, like we need to operate this detector that's taking collision data and you know, make sure that it runs smoothly and that the data acquisition works. Uh, I'm working on um, the muon system in the Atlas detector. Um, so there's a new component in the muon system that is brand new for run three. Um, mm -hmm. It was just put in and there's a lot of commissioning work that needs to be done. In particular, I'm working on a calibration. Um, so there's a particular readout in that detector uh -huh. that I need yeah. to calibrate so that we know, well, okay, if we see this value in the readout that corresponds to this like physical thing that was actually present in the detector. Mm. Yeah, so so that's that's a big part of what I'm currently working on. Um, the other thing I do is um, mainly targeted at the intersection of machine learning and particle physics. Um, this is an area that I found really fascinating. There's been lots of progress in, in the last few years, lots of new ideas, all revolving around how we can use machine learning to better improve how we analyze the data that comes out of our detector. Yeah. 
Um, so one thing I do is in the realm of jet tagging. Mm -hmm. um, this is the idea that we can use machine learning to recognize particular patterns of interesting particles within the detector, right? So um, we make a lot of different things at the LHC. Um, unfortunately, most of the time we make nothing interesting. Mm -hmm. Instead of making, uh, for example, a top quark or a Higgs particle, we make some up, down, or down, up or down quark, which are cool, but not so interesting. We know how they work for the most part. Yeah. And so often we want to purify our data set. We want to cut out all the background, namely the anything that might come from up and down quarks or gluons, and only isolate the top or the Higgs, right? And we can use machine learning to do this. It's a classification problem. Yeah. So I work on that. Um, and then I'm starting, now that I'm kind of in the midway point of my PhD, to turn towards working on a thesis analysis. Mm -hmm. um, so this is where I will make a physics measurement using the Atlas detector, and that will like make up the main body of what goes into my PhD thesis. Mm -hmm. This I want to be on, um, on, a, on a type of analysis that uses a kind of a novel idea in physics, um, which is to use machine learning to do unfolding. Mm -hmm. um, so unfolding is the idea that you can in, uh, invert the detector, basically. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, particle collisions are complicated. They involve a lot of different um, processes that kind of factorize. So the first thing that happens is what we're interested in, which is the interaction of two protons that produce some heavy, interesting particle. Top quarks, Higgs particles, W, Z, any of these, right? The second thing that happens is um, there's some hadronization that occurs when quarks basically lead to a spray of other particles um, due to interactions with a strong force. This part is not so important for a global understanding. The most important part for my work is the actual detection, mm -hmm. right? So um, we need to, it's not enough just to make the collision happen. You need to detect it. You need to measure um, the particles as they pass through your detector in order to further quantity their properties. And um, that detection is never perfect. No detection is perfect. Um, there's always finite resolution in the readout of your detector. There's, you know, um, yeah, so that you have finite resolution. And that means that you kind of need to account for those detector effects in your data somehow. And the common way to do this is to make comparisons between data and theory, like by using a simulation of the detector. Yeah. Where we simulate the detector, assuming the standard model is true. Yeah. Right, mm -hmm. and then compare those predictions to our data. But there's kind of another idea, which is, well, what if instead of running the detector simulation forward, I could invert the detector simulation? Mm -hmm. That is, I could take my data set and map it to what it kind of would, what process would have produced it. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a process called unfolding. Mm -hmm. Um, it's done every day in particle physics. It's something that you know we have to do whenever we want to compare measurements between different experiments. But the issue is that, well, um, you can only do it in one or two dimensions. Mm -hmm. um, existing techniques are only that powerful. And so instead, we think that it might be useful to use machine learning to do this in many higher dimensions. Mm -hmm. um, you can unfold like a lot more details of your actual measurements using machine learning. Um, and so we're working on methods to do this. And the hope is that I'll apply one of these high dimensional methods in order and to make a measurement um, in my thesis analysis. So that's kind of what I'm moving towards. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and as you can ex expect, these sort of like machine learning based projects require a lot, a lot of statistical inference. Yeah. So <laughs> it's, it's, it's yeah. something that's very, very present in my mind. Yeah, no, for sure. And uh... I mean, we'll see that in the whole episode, but mainly the like the intrication of stats and physics is always extremely, extremely profound. Yeah. And uh, and deep, and that's funny because what you just told about unfolding and the mm -hmm. process is something that's very common in the Bayesian statistics framework, where we have the forward sampling, where we would basically um, simulate data, generate data based on. Uh, the parameter values. Mm -hmm. So that would be what you were saying, where we simulate basically what would happen in the uh, in the detector, and then we get some simulated data. But then when we do the inference, when we run the MCMC uh, mm -hmm. algorithm, 
we that's doing what's called backward sampling and so that's going the other way around where we have observed data and the question is well what version of the world could have created that like what version uh, and here what version of the world mean what which values of the parameters would have generated the data that we observed uh, yes. which would be the unfolding here uh, that you told uh, you talked about so yeah very interesting to see that that parallel i wasn't aware of that uh, because, exactly you know, so yeah unfolding is an example of an inverse problem yeah. right where mm -hmm. you have a well-defined forward operator yeah. that will map some observable from what you're in, the space you're interested in yeah. to the space you actually detect yeah right uh, and that map is well defined but it doesn't necessarily have a strict inverse mm -hmm. yeah and even if it does have an inverse, which in our case it doesn't. Yeah. Um, it might not be clear how to exactly. calculate it. It right? might be also a lot of values. Different values are compatible. Different values of the parameters right. are compatible with the same data right. that you've observed. Yeah. yeah. So it's not it's not in yeah. formally invertible, right? Yeah. Exactly. And so yeah. yeah, you need to make a statistical claim. Yeah. Right. It it doesn't make sense. Probability for claim. Us yeah. to say yeah. that okay, I give you a measurement that our, mm -hmm. my detector made, what was the configuration of particles that produced it, right? Yeah, yeah. Because that map is not defined. There are many different configurations of yeah. particles that could have produced the same detector signature. Exactly. Yeah. And so we always need to make a probabilistic claim. It yeah. was this configuration with this probability. <laughs> um, and yeah. yeah, so of course, like the statistical modeling is very important here. Yeah, no, for sure. That, that's super interesting. And uh, that's also why it, like at the very beginning, Bayesian statistics was called inverse probabilities mm -hmm. because of this inverse inference problem. Even though inverse inference inverse probability is a bit weird because it's just like what does that mean? It's just a probability, right? So, yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah. But okay, super cool. And well we're gonna see that just after once, um, the Atlas control room. Uh, but Atlas is one of the experiments you're working on. Yes. So um, yeah, can you quickly define what that experiment is about for uh, listeners before we head out to the control room, room where you're gonna like show us all of that and detail that uh, a lot more but basically the elevator pitch for for the atlas experiment yeah absolutely so um well the big thing that we have here at cern that exists nowhere else in the world is the large hadron collider mm -hmm. um, it is the highest energy collider in the world um and Atlas is one of the two general purpose experiments on this collider. What I mean by general purpose is just that it reconstructs um, every single type of particle that might come out of a collision event. And it does it in the full like 360 degree surrounding of the, of the collision, mm -hmm. right? And so you can use this detector to do a lot of different things. To, recon to understand the properties of like just about any property of the collision that you can come up with. Okay. So Atlas is one of the two experiments that does this. Um, and the whole goal of this experiment is to figure out what is happening beyond the standard model. Mm -hmm. So currently in physics, um, we have this thing called the standard model that is an exceptionally good um, description of how the universe works. It accounts for just about everything that we have ever attempted to measure in a lab. Um, it can describe you know, the properties of the matter that makes up you and me, all the matter that we're familiar with. It describes the properties of much more exotic forms of matter, things like antimatter, things like um, these heavy particles that live for a fraction of a second and then decay. These are things like the W and Z bosons and the top and the, uh, the Higgs boson, which is probably most famous, is what CERN is most famous for discovering. Um, so the standard model works for all of these different kinds of particles. And it's incredible. It's the most amazing theoretical framework. Um, and it just works beautifully well. But the issue is we know it's all wrong. Um, we, we know that it cannot be the end of the story. And, and there, there are a lot of things that the standard model doesn't account for. These are things like dark matter. These are things like the matter-antimatter matter asymmetry in the universe. These are things like the masses of the neutrinos. Um, the list really, there is a pretty long list of issues with the standard model. Some of them are direct experimental evidence, like we know for a fact that we're seeing beyond the standard model physics here. Other things are like issues that theorists might have with the theory because it doesn't really appear to respect some of the things they like to see in their theories, certain naturalness arguments. But 
at the end of the day, we know the standard model is just dead wrong. Mm -hmm. But the question is, like, how? Yeah. Um, we're at a really frustrating point in particle physics. We're, we're almost victims of our own success. The theory have worked so well that we can't shake ourselves loose from it. It's, and so um, the whole point of Atlas is to try to understand where the standard model breaks. That's what we're trying, that's what we're looking for. And Atlas in that, where, where does it fit in? So one of the best ways to test the standard model is by using a collider, where you take two protons and you smack them together at very, very high energies. Uh, the reason this is helpful is because you know a lot of the physics that we don't know about happens at energy scales much higher than what exists in the everyday world right so we do this by um, colliding protons at the center of atlas and then in that brief collision we produce all these exotic types of particles maybe even particles that we don't know about then um, these particles usually decay to other things that we know quite well, and then we watch them interact with our detector. Um, this, de this detector produces data, and that data can be analyzed to try to um, reconstruct all of, the all of the collision products, everything that flies out of the collision after we smack the protons together. And then that data, um, and then those collision products, the measurements of them can be used to infer what happened in the underlying collision. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, the Atlas detector is in many ways like the world's most expensive and most and largest digital camera. Mm -hmm. It takes photographs of collisions. Um, it takes photographs of the remnants of collisions, mm -hmm. rather. Mm -hmm. And once we have those photographs of the remnants, we can do a bunch of statistical analysis on all of these different patterns and yeah. try to understand what exactly happened in the collision of two protons. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and like what they what what really occurred, what particles were produced, what their properties were and whether there's anything that's occurring inside that collision that is not accounted for in the standard model. Uh, okay. yeah, that's yeah. the hope. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and on that you work a lot uh, on muons, mm -hmm. which is a uh, kind of particle that we're gonna talk about much more uh, in a few minutes when we head out to the uh, control room where you're gonna tell us what muons are about and what you guys do <laughs> about all those muons that uh, you create in the collider and then you are trying to see what they are all about yeah uh, before we do that um you work in the group of daniel whiteson right that's right um, so daniel if you're listening to us hi uh <laughs> and if listeners are curious daniel was on the podcast before i think it's episode 72 it's called why the universe is so deliciously crazy uh, it's a very fun episode, so I recommend listeners to, lis uh, to listen to it. And if you're curious about all our physics episodes, uh, I've done a, a few now. So there is a playlist about with all the physics episodes. So you go to the website, neuronbasedstats.com, and to the playlist physics, or you go to the YouTube channel, and there is a playlist with all our physics episodes. And now, uh, Kevin, let's head out to the... Control room. Just watch me update the predictions in everyone's brains. Teaching a crowd about probabilistical statistical science. For instance, if the president's a proving degenerate liar, remember your priors and be skeptical whenever he's testifying. Is it always inaccurate? No, but you discount outliers. So this is the Atlas control room. Um, there are six desks in the control room. Uh, each of them is staffed 24 seven when we do have beam. Um, so briefly, just the six different tasks that exist within here. There's a shift leader that sits in the middle um, here, and they're sort of in charge of the whole operation. They um, interact with the LHC. They keep track of everything that's happening. They're in charge of the whole operation. There is a run control shifter. Their job is to keep track of the data acquisition software mm -hmm. and make sure that it's running. They're kind of like the shift leader's second in command, um, sort of like the, the first mate, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are four shifters for each of the detector subsystems. Then there's the calorimeters, which are in the back right, this person right here. Um, so they're in charge of the detectors that measure the energy of particles. And then in the front and then the back left, is the muon desk. Mm -hmm. um, so that is in charge of the systems that detect muons. Remember, muons, um, they're very hard to stop, right? Mm -hmm. They're particles that will smash through just about all matter that we put in front of them. For that reason, we have a dedicated detector just to find muons. Um, and this is actually something that's pretty near and dear to my heart, because that's what I work on. I work on the muon system. And so when I do shifts, I work on the muon desk. 
So triggering is something that we have to do at the LHC because we have such a high event rate. Um, we collide a bunch of protons every 25 nanoseconds in the LHC. So if you do the math, that corresponds to about a billion collisions per second. Uh, <laughs> that's an extraordinary number of collisions, right? Um, we can't save the data from every one of those collisions because the data would just be too big. Yeah. There's no readout system in existence that can do this. Yeah. And so we have a trigger system that will throw out the vast majority of the collisions and only save the ones that appear to be interesting to us. I spent a lot of long nights in here where um, everything's going smoothly or even there's no beam and um, you know it, it's kind of boring. And then there's also times when everything's broken, right? And like it gets really fast paced because mm -hmm. you know things are broken, something needs to be fixed, and there's beam in like five minutes. And if we don't fix the thing, there's going to be a loss of data, which we don't want. Yeah. And so the control room is either a very sleepy place or a very exciting place, and there's basically no in between. Um, <laughs> there's there's no like uh, there's no average day in the control room. It's it's either very boring or very exciting, um, <laughs> but. Um, it's still a cool place to be. Yeah. Um, and yeah. what's the what's the frequency of the, you know, the repartition of the boring versus very exciting days? <laughs> yeah, good question. When there's no beam, it's all boring. Yeah. Um, when there is beam, oh gosh, the the exciting things. I would say like every third shift I worked usually has something exciting happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and how many how many shifts do you do? Yeah, so um, for at least my desk, the one mm -hmm. that I usually work at, mm -hmm. um, we do, I think the, the guidance is like 15 shifts per year. Um, that corresponds to about five blocks of three shifts. Ah, so okay. you kind of shift right. in like in a row. So okay. you have like multiple days in a row where you're mm -hmm. filling the same time slot. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the time slots, it, it works just like, you know, a factory night where um, you have like morning shift that goes from 7 a.m. to 3, the evening shift, which is from 3 to 11, and then the graveyard shift, which is 11 to 7 a.m. Oh, damn. Um, yeah. Through the whole night. Yeah, and, and those are the ones I usually end up working, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the night shifts, they can be a bit painful, but, um, you know, it, it's also like, a, it's also kind of a fun thing. You're on, you're on shift with all of your colleagues and you get to know some people, and um, if everything's running smoothly, you get some good work time in too. So yeah. it's nice. The control room, that's where you get the data back. Uh, mm. And then what happens once you have these data? Yeah, good. So the data is um, processed in the data center, which mm -hmm. is we're going to see later. Ah, okay. um, so right. that is actually not here. Okay. That's yeah. over on the CERN across the road, basically. Mm -hmm. We have some fiber cables that take the data from our computing center, mm -hmm. um, which is actually downstairs, as close to the detector as we can, okay. um, for yeah. some reasons I can describe. Um, and then the data is put through a fiber cable across the road to the CERN data center. And that's mm -hmm. where it's actually like written to disk mm -hmm. and tape so that we can process it offline. Okay. Right. Yeah. But all of our online processing happens here. Mm -hmm. And it actually happens in a service cavern that's right adjacent to the Atlas cavern, right? So there's the big room where the experiment is. And then next to that, there's a smaller room where we have a bunch of computing racks. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where we run all of the data acquisition for our experiment. So all of the trigger systems, um, all of the monitoring, all of that is run in computers downstairs. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and we put that so close to the detector because, well, of the speed of light, right? So when you're triggering on an event every 25 nanoseconds, mm -hmm. It's actually kind of amazing, right? So if, if you think about, you know, just do some calculations based on assuming the particles producing a collision are about relativistic, so they're moving at the speed of light, right? You, and think about how big the Atlas detector is. You realize if you collide two particles and then they make stuff and that stuff starts moving outward, right? It hasn't actually left the detector by the time the next collision has already started, mm -hmm. right? So we're already colliding before one event, the previous event is even finished. Mm -hmm. Before like any yeah. muons or stuff that we make has left the detector and mm -hmm. finished leaving like traces that we can read out. And so the speed of light is actually a big limiting factor for us. Mm. That means that if we had our trigger systems, right, the computers that are deciding what events to read out and what events to keep, right? Um, if we had them like far away, even across the road, we would have a lot of latency because we need to send signal through fiber optic cables mm. back and forth between mm -hmm. the computers and the detectors. Um, and so that's why we put them right next to the detector as close as possible because mm. then we pay less of a price in the latency due to the length of our fiber cables. Yeah. 
And uh, otherwise, if you had a lot of latency, you would have a lot of noise. That means you would like see several events at the same time, even though they didn't happen at the same time. Yeah. Well, what would really happen is that is that we would have um, basically the way triggering works is you take the data coming off your detector and you put it in a buffer, right? Mm -hmm. And you store it in that buffer until you get some decision mm -hmm. about whether or not it should be saved or discarded. Okay. Right. So every event kind of is put into this buffer. And then it waits for the signal from the trigger systems as to whether that event should be read out or discarded. Mm -hmm. um, and if we had you know, a longer gap in time in our trigger systems, like a longer latency in our trigger, we would basically need a bigger buffer, yeah. right? Yeah. And well, the buffer is, it, they, these, there's a limited size due to hardware constraints, due to memory constraints. And so, um, yeah, the whole system is designed assuming that we have this size of delay, this latency in our trigger decisions. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody has their own. I really wish I could get you underground and you could see the detector. <laughs> it's so cool. It's such a beautiful thing. Um, but, you know, everybody kind of has their own like reaction to when they see it the first time because mm -hmm. it's kind of an over, it's, it's enormous, right? Yeah. It's this huge underground room. It's, it's, a, it's, it's the size of a six story building. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but at least the one that I had was, I can't believe this thing works. Mm -hmm. Like, it is so complicated. There are, I, I mean, you just can't believe that, you know, we actually get data out of the detector that we can analyze and turn into physics. Because mm -hmm. it just seems so extraordinarily complicated. And But through a lot of effort, we do <laughs> manage to do it. Um, it kind of boggles, it, it, kind of, it kind of blows my mind every day. And why is it that big? Why does it have to be that big? What? Yeah, great. Um, so uh, we were talking about the muons. Um, yeah. The basically the, the answer is muons. Um, okay. So why it has to be this big because muons are very heavy. Mm -hmm. And so and, wait, now you're talking about why Atlas has to be that big or why the LHC has to be that big? Why Atlas has to be that big? Yeah, yeah. perfect. LHC is a different question, yeah. but but Atlas at least is this size because. Muons are very heavy, mm -hmm. and muons, they need to, in order to infer their momentum, we need to bend them in a magnetic field, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, well, the size of the curvature, right, the radius of the curvature mm -hmm. depends on the magnetic field and also on the mass. So if you make the mass really big with holding the magnetic field constant, you're going to have less curvature, mm -hmm. right? And that means that you need to measure more distance as the particle travels in order to reconstruct the the radius of curvature with the same precision, mm -hmm. right? So for that reason, we so need to have a very big um, like measurement. You need to measure the radius, of the track of a muon um, over a large distance in mm -hmm. order to actually watch it bend. Um, and so that's why Atlas needs to be this size. What you call reconstructing muons here, that means creating muons? Yeah, so it means muons are created in the collision, right? Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. But reconstructing is after they have been produced in the collision, we need to infer their properties. Mm -hmm. So whether they're there, right, that's the first thing. Do we actually see a muon in the event? And then after we say whether or not there is a muon, we have to say things about what its energy and momentum are, right? Um, those are kind of the three, the, the fundamental things that you can measure and also what direction it's going, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, yeah. And and, that's, so, and that's muon reconstruction just yeah. boils down to inferring the properties of the muon after you've, from your measurements. Creating them, yeah. And yeah, so exactly. Is that because, so can you tell us why uh, we're interested in muons, actually, like why it's interesting to study them? Um, and like, what do we know about muons actually now? And so what yeah. are we trying to to uh, discover right now with these kind of experiments. Yeah, great. So um, the first thing I should say is muons, they, they're the reason that Atlas has to be this big, right? Mm -hmm. But they're not the only experiment, they're not the only particle that we're interested in reconstructing, right? Okay. We're also reconstruct interested in reconstructing anything else that we might produce in a collision. Mm -hmm. So that, um, the whole suite of things that we can see in a collision are electrons, muons, essentially, these are two leptons, um, and then photons. Um, these are the, you know, this is like essentially just light. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. um, and then beyond photons, we have all of the quarks. So we can produce a lot of quarks in our collisions. These will um, produce um, what we call hydronic matter. That's just mm -hmm. any matter that's composed of quarks. Mm -hmm. And those things um, we also want to reconstruct. 
So we're interested in, in reconstructing electrons, photons, muons, and quarks, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, so to speak. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we're interested in doing all of that. Now, why we're interested in doing it? So the whole name of the game in particle physics is to measure the remnants of a collision. So anything that we are interested in, these are things like Higgs bosons, like top quarks, like W and Z bosons, or maybe even exotic particles that we haven't discovered yet, mm -hmm. right? One of the assumptions that we sort of make is that these things will be very heavy and that they will decay to other things pretty quickly. Mm, okay. Right? So, for example, the Higgs boson, it only lives for a tiny fraction of a second before it decays to something else, right? We actually don't have any chance to measure a Higgs boson directly. Mm -hmm. We'll never watch a Higgs boson pass through a particle detector. It just doesn't live long enough. Mm -hmm. This is also true for the top quark, also true for the W and Z bosons, and true for a lot of models of new particles you might be looking for. Um, now, that's an assumption we make. There are also ways to look for particles that new particles that might live long enough to actually be detected. Um, but um, a lot of times we just kind of, in, in a lot of cases, we assume that new stuff will be heavy and it will decay quickly to other things, right? Mm -hmm. So once we have that assumption, you need to reconstruct the things that the heavy stuff decays to, mm -hmm. and then use the properties of the of the remnants of the decay products to yeah. reconstruct to, to infer what happened. Yeah, infer back. Yeah, right mm -hmm. to infer back. Mm -hmm. So let's imagine that we make a Higgs boson. Mm -hmm. Right, one of the ways a Higgs boson can decay is to two bottom quarks. This happens, I think, about sixty percent of the time mm -hmm. when you produce a Higgs. Um, so we have two bottom quarks that will manifest itself as two. Um, they're called jets. These are things that basically signify the presence of a quark, mm -hmm. right? Anytime we have a jet in the detector, that is th that means we made a quark. Yeah. Um, and we can look at the, reconstruct those jets. We can take data, we can measure them in our detector, and then using the properties of the jets, we can infer the, Higgs, the properties of the Higgs boson um, that we produced. So that's kind of the idea. It's all about um, looking at the, property, the properties of particles that we produce, measuring them, and using them to refer what happened in the actual collision itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's kind of like, you know, it's like a measure, it's like forensics in a way. Yeah, you know, yeah. like you show up at some crime scene and you look around and you say, oh, there's some patterns here that I can use to understand what actually happened in the past, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? It's all about inferring backward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and that's why we need to reconstruct everything in an event, right? Mm -hmm. We can't just look at one type of particle because part, the collisions in the LHC produce every kind of particle. Yeah. So we need to reconstruct everything and then um, use all of that data to kind of figure out what happened. Mm -hmm. um, and they are probably also created, I guess, like it's, I'm guessing it must be hard to like just create a muon without creating other particles? Yeah, that's right. That's absolutely right. So you're right in a few ways, actually. So the first way you're right is that, of course, sometimes uh, events can produce multiple particles, mm -hmm. right? So they can produce two muons, for example, yeah. or they can produce muons and some quarks. Mm -hmm. So we would get like some signatures in the muon detectors, and we would also see some jets from mm -hmm. the quarks, right? Mm -hmm. So that can happen. The other thing that can happen is we actually, in the LHC, don't just collide one proton at a time. This would be great if we could do it, but um, because we want to take a lot of collisions, and most of the collisions that occur are kind of uninteresting, mm -hmm. we actually co uh, collide many protons at once. Mm -hmm. So instead of having like one proton and having them come together, we have these bunches of protons, mm -hmm. right? And there are, I forget the exact number, but I think it's a few thousand protons mm -hmm. in each bunch. And then these bunches fly past each other. Okay. What that means is often you'll get multiple proton-proton interactions per bunch crossing. Mm -hmm. So we have, um, anytime we trigger an event, there will be an underlying like vertex where the, the, the actual thing that caused the trigger, right? So this contains the physics that we're interested in, um, you know, so maybe we, this proton-proton interaction produced a W boson or mm -hmm. a Higgs boson or a top or anything like that. But then behind that, we'll also have many other interactions between protons that didn't do something interesting, where we just produced some light quarks, some gluons, and it's not the kind of physics that we're interested in analyzing, yeah, right? Yeah. And so this is called pileup. This is what happens when we have interesting physics superimposed on a bunch of nonsense. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, we have to deal with that, right? So we have all sorts of techniques for trying to mitigate the effects 
of these pile-up collisions on the actual physics that we want to study. Um, yeah, so, so this, is, this is something we have to deal with. Um, and in fact, currently, we're running at about mu equals 60. So mu is it's, it's, a, it's some collider physics lingo, but basically it um, corresponds to the average number of pile-up interactions mm -hmm. in each bunch crossing. Okay. So that means that currently we have about 60 pile-up interactions in each of our bunch crossings. Mm -hmm. Right, so we have one interesting collision for sixty, and that is superimposed on mm -hmm. top of, on average, sixty mm -hmm. uninteresting collisions that yeah, we need right. to basically discard. Okay, yeah, yeah, which is a good ratio, or it's a it's a ratio that we can deal with, yeah. but it's a lot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it um, sounds like a lot, but it, I, I don't know. It's a lot, yeah. yeah. Um, so it it's it's something that we do we, we can deal with it. Mm -hmm. um, so there's kind of a trade off that happens. On the one hand, the higher the pile up, that means we get more luminosity, right? So the more often we collide protons together, the more often we're going to see interesting physics. Mm -hmm. We're going to see what we want to see, right? Higgs bosons, top quarks, all the good stuff. It also means that the more often we're going to see uninteresting stuff, mm -hmm. right? So as we crank up the pile up, we're going to get more interesting physics, but at the cost of yeah. also having it put on top of a bunch more uninteresting stuff, yeah. right? And all that uninteresting stuff, in addition to making our events more noisy, it also puts a lot of stress on our trigger systems. Mm -hmm. And that's the real issue with pileup, mm -hmm. is that if we put the pileup too high, our trigger systems won't be able to handle the event rate, mm -hmm. the, the data rate, and you know it, it will cause some dead time. Yeah, yeah, Basically yeah. time where we're not taking data because our trigger systems are overloaded. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so we can barely manage to run at this pileup rate right now. Um, we're trying to push that higher mm -hmm. because the higher it goes, the more chance we have to observe interesting physics. But we are oftentimes limited by our trigger systems by just what the data readout can actually handle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is what's happening currently right now. If we had been, it would be happening as we speak. Mm -hmm. um, it will be happening hopefully again in a few weeks. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing I might say is that in future runs of the LHC, we want to push that um, pile up the, the, well, I guess the luminosity of the beam, but also the pile up a lot higher. Mm -hmm. um, so the currently, I think the estimate is that we'll be running at about pile up of 200 mm -hmm. um, for the high luminosity runs. So um, that means that we'll have 200 pile up interactions for each interesting interaction we see, <laughs> which is a lot more, yeah. right? And for that reason, there's a lot of people working on upgrading Atlas, on uh, taking out old detectors, putting in new ones, upgrading the readout, um, just so that we can deal with this much higher event rate, right? Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. we're not doing, we're not cranking up the event rate because we want to measure a bunch of pileup interactions that we don't care about. Yeah. We want to produce a lot more interesting stuff. Yeah. And if we make the luminosity and the, the luminosity of the beams that much higher, then we'll get the chance to see a lot of really interesting things, um, which is what will happen in the future runs of the LSD. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And the way you deal with these pileup interactions, as you say, um, is that happening on the experimental side, or is that happening on the statistical side? So, like you're yeah. using mod statistical modeling to um, like make sense of the interactions and then filter out the pileup ones. So, I think I, I don't. I'm not an expert on exactly how pileup is dealt with in all of the different subsystems, mm -hmm. right? What I do know is that there is a lot of work that goes into, uh, in particular, mitigating pileup and the reconstruction of jets. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so jets are complicated signatures within a detector. They're not just one particle, right? And the reason is that quarks, quarks are kind of funny things. They don't like existing by themselves, mm -hmm. right? They, whenever you make a quark, it will produce other quarks and gluons along with it, mm -hmm. just because of this thing called color confinement. It's the nature of the strong force. Um, essentially because the strong force is very strong, right? It's the things that actually hold the quarks within protons and neutrons together, right? Um, because it's so strong, whenever you make a quark with um, some, you know, a, a quark just by itself, it will pull other quarks out of the vacuum mm -hmm. in order to make itself 
color neutral. Okay. Um, basically, so it doesn't have the charge that is felt by the color, mm. by the strong force. Mm -hmm. um, this is a process called hadronization, mm -hmm. right? So anytime I make a quark by itself, it will make a bunch of other stuff along with it. Okay. That's why quarks are reconstructed as jets. Mm -hmm. because you make one quark and then it makes a bunch of other stuff and then that other stuff is what actually interacts with the detector, right? So these objects are tricky to re reconstruct and in particular they're tricky to reconstruct when there's a lot of pile up mm -hmm. because it's tough to tell whether all the stuff that the quark made came from the actual quark itself or whether it came from some pile up collision, right? Now one of the ways we have to do with it, we deal with this, is um, we can actually map um, we, we can tell kind of where all of this charged stuff in a jet came, came from by looking at the tracks and whether they connect to the primary vertex. Mm -hmm. And there's some statistical modeling that happens in trying to understand what jets came from the primary vertex and what jets came from in pile up. Mm, okay. So yeah, it, you look inside a jet and you try to say, okay, all of the stuff in here kind of came from the primary vertex as part of the jet I'm interested in measure versus this stuff did not come from the primary vertex, it's due to pile. Yeah, yeah. So people are using machine learning mm -hmm. to try to understand and like, you know, tag which jets are due to the actually the interacting, the, the primary vertex we're interested in and which parts are due to pile up. Yeah, and of course, yeah. that's a statistical thing. Right? Yeah. Sounds like a labeling, uh, modeling. Thing. Yeah, exactly. It's a, it's a classifier in the end, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So, but this is a statistical claim, right? It's not. Yeah. We can't claim for sure that this signature yeah, exactly. came from this vertex. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, at least in the case of neutral particles, mm -hmm. because they don't leave tracks in our mm -hmm. tracking detectors, so it's impossible to trace them back yeah, yeah. to the primary vertex, mm -hmm. right? I see. But we can make statistical claims about it. We can say that with this uncertainty, we can probably say that this jet came from the primary vertex. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the uncertainty with that claim gets rolled into all of our physics analyses propagated through, and it actually ends up being an uncertainty in our final physics results. Mm -hmm. So the better you make your statistical model, the more accurate it is, the better your final results are going to be. Yeah. Um, so yeah. that's, that's always kind of one of the things that people are trying to do, figure out how we can improve our statistical models to reconstruct these events better and yeah. improve the precision of our statistical claims. Yeah. Um, yeah. Here are that people. Improve your statistics models. <laughs> yes, always, always. Yeah, this yeah. is something we want to do. Yeah. And, and something... Physics and statistics are actually like always extremely linked. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, right. especially in this yeah. physics, especially yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. This, this is the physics where statistics becomes so important. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and it's, base, it's because we, you know, it's because we never actually observe what we want to observe. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. We and can't sure measure Higgs bosons. Uncertainty is very important, probabilities and things like that. Yeah, exactly. So, Bayesian stats. Yes. <laughs> Everybody loves Bayesian stats. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, maybe there's a few other things I can show you briefly before yeah, we should get to the data center. So we oh, can yeah. see like right. how the data is actually processed and yes. all that. So, just really quickly, we have a few like interesting pieces of our detector mm -hmm. in these display cases so that we can show them. Yeah. Um, so very quickly, um, sort of working outward from mm -hmm. the interaction point of Atlas um, mm -hmm. to the farthest reaches of Atlas, we start with the um, tracking detectors. So these are the things that measure the properties of electrons mm -hmm. and charge hadrons as they pass and bend through a magnetic field. So it's the same name of the game, right? You want to measure the momentum of stuff and to do that, you need to bend it in a magnetic field and reconstruct the radius of curvature. Um, we have detectors that do that for anything that's not a muon right next to the interaction point. Um, these two pieces here are called um, silicon detectors. Mm -hmm. So they are just um, little, tiny little circuits printed on silicon boards. Mm -hmm. And when a particle passes through them, they'll put a little electrical pulse on those circuits. And we can read that out and use it to infer the presence of a particle. Um, on top of that here, this is a piece of the TRT. Um, it's essentially the same idea as a silicon detector, right? Tiny little, um, cir tiny little circuits that will, uh, when a particle passes through it, will leave a pulse. Um, but just the circuits are bigger. You can see they're these like tube things instead yeah. of tiny little things printed on silicon. Um, and then this right here, these tubes, the big tubes, this is a piece of the muon detector. Mm -hmm. So the dedicated detector that reconstructs muons instead of anything that's an electron or a charged hadron. Um, as you can see, 
you kind of go from like the smallest precision in yeah. terms of the spatial resolution mm -hmm. up to a little bit bigger, up to the biggest. Mm -hmm. And that corresponds from being really, really close to the actual interaction point to a bit farther away to the furthest out. Um, we kind of get less interested in position resolution as you get further and further away from the interaction point, um, just because we need less precision, both in measuring the radius of curvature and trying to figure out where exactly the track originates. Mm -hmm. um, whether it comes from the interaction we're interested in or whether it comes from some pileup interaction around it. Mm. Right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. By the time we're out in the muon system, it's kind of hard to do that reconstruction. And so we don't care about position resolution so much. Um, yeah, which is why the tubes get bigger. So in this case, we have um, pieces of, well, let's see, we have pieces of more silicon tractor trackers. Mm -hmm. um, these are number two and three right here. It's essentially, uh, actually, two and three are here and here. Um, same idea. It's tiny little stripped pieces of silicon with circuits printed on them that can be used for charge particle tracking. Mm -hmm. um, the interesting thing in this display case is we also have this butterfly-shaped thing. Mm -hmm. So that's a piece of the calorimeter. Calor calorimeters are a bit different than trackers. Instead of trying to measure the position of a particle with a lot of resolution, you're trying to measure energy, mm -hmm. right? So Energy, um, essentially what you do is you take a particle and you plow it into a bunch of matter. And then when it hits, interacts with that matter, it will create these showers of other stuff. Mm -hmm. And the amount of other stuff that you make will be proportional to the energy that the particle had to begin with. Mm -hmm. right? And so we have two different calorimeters within Atlas. One of them is a liquid argon calorimeter, of which this butterfly-shaped thing is a piece. It's a big tank filled with liquid argon. And when a electron or photon runs into the liquid argon, it produces a shower. Mm -hmm. And then we have some readout within the tank of argon that can actually pick up the signals of that shower and um, use it to, re to infer the energy that that electron or photon had. Mm, okay. Yeah. So that's the liquid argon calorimeter. The other calorimeter we have is tile, which is so big that we had to put a sample of it in the floor. So you can see it here. Uh, it's called tile for good reason. You can see it's made of these interleaved tiles, mm -hmm. one of which is this clear material, mm -hmm. and the other is a kind of, um, you know, it, it's, it's an opaque material. Yeah. So the idea here is that the opaque material is the thing that the particle actually interacts with and, you know, it, it's the thing that causes the particle to give up its energy in the form of a shower. And then the clear material is what is used to measure the properties of the shower, mm -hmm. right? So you kind of have this alternating process of making the particle interact and give up its energy and then measuring how much energy it's given up. Um, and so that kind of happens over and over and over again as the particle passes through the tile calorimeter, right? And then each of the clear segments has an associated readout through these fiber cables that you can see right here. Um, we've lit them up for a little bit of mm -hmm. drama. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> they, they don't actually glow green like that down mm -hmm. in the cavern, but it kind of gives you the idea, right? You hook up these fibers to each of the scintillating modules, and yeah. then those will, though you can use that to infer the um, energy of your particle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, this tile calorimeter is in particular for measuring the energy of hadronic stuff, right? So anything that is made up of quarks. Whereas the liquid argon calorimeter, as I said, it's, it's for measuring anything that's an electron or a photon. Um, anything that interacts through the electromagnetic magnetic force versus the strong force. Um, yeah, we have two different calorimeters because um, basically, the, anything that interacts strongly needs kind of more encouragement to give up its energy versus anything that interacts electromagnetically that um, you can make it give up its energy much quicker and you can get better resolution on the energy of that thing if you have a dedicated calorimeter for anything that interacts electromagnetically versus mm -hmm. just having one calorimeter for everything. Mm -hmm. So that's why there's two systems. So before we go to the data center, yeah, that that's the control room just behind you, um, and you said that um, yeah, control room shifts can be quite eventful. Yeah. So I'm just wondering what's the most eventful uh, shift you've had until you started here 
about since you started <laughs> here about one year ago? Yeah, interesting. Um, so I guess probably the most eventful one would be basically when the data acquisition system um, crashed. Mm -hmm. um, that means that the entire detector is not taking data. Mm -hmm. Well, not the entire detector, but um, just the piece of the detector, the muon system, which is what I was shifting for. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and when that crashed, the entire detector was not taking data, and so we needed to try to figure out what was wrong um, and fix it. In the end, what was happening was that one of the readout channels within the detector was sending data at a really high rate. Mm -hmm. um, and this happens sometimes. Sometimes we get noisy channels for whatever reason, and you have a lot of data coming off. And when you have like a ton of data coming off, it crashes the whole system. Um, and so we had to debunk that and figure out how to mask that channel so that the rest of the system could recover. Mm -hmm. um, and that took some time. Um, that's probably the most dramatic thing that I ever had happen. So let me show you how to be a good Bayesian and change your predictions after taking information in. And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing, let's adjust those expectations. I, I really like this statue a lot. It kind of shows you like the way that science wanders through and like one discovery builds on each one. Yeah. And like how even discover even even like ideas that turn out to be wrong, like the the, you know the Ptolemaic model of the yeah. solar system, for example. Yeah. Like, add something to science. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's, it's, ideas don't have to be right to be scientific. They just have to be useful. Okay. That's one of the interesting things I think. Um, and reproducible. Know, and reproducible. Absolutely. Yeah, of course. You know, it, models can be wrong. That's okay. And the standard model that we currently have, that is our most up to date and our best understanding of the universe, is demonstrably wrong. Yeah. There are so many things in the universe that it just does not account for. In yeah. fact, the vast majority of things. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's part of the story, but it is not the end. Um, and the hope, the hope is that one of these days we'll understand what the next chapter is. Mm -hmm. um, but thus far, we still don't know. Yeah. What's the, like personally, what's your, um, you know, one big question you would really like the answer to? Yeah. Before I die, I want to know what dark matter is. Yeah. Yeah. That's 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 like the thing that I think we have the best chance of cracking within yeah. the next fifty years. Uh -huh. Like you know, we know a lot about it already. We know a lot about what it can't be. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, it's still a total mystery to us, like what its actual particle nature is. We know it exists. We know there's a lot of it, but we don't really know what it's really made out of. Yeah. And how it works. Um, and it's it's a problem that seems so immediate right we look out in the universe and we see something and yeah, we just yeah. don't see it here on earth and we have no idea why yeah, yeah. Um, so it, yeah i I, th i think that's a problem we can really crack um, and, and i i i hope to know the answer yeah. uh, before, before before i die that yeah. would be awesome that would be so cool yeah that'd be cool yeah what, can you give a quick um definition of dark matter for for the listeners oh of course yeah so dark matter um so dark matter is this it's this huge open problem in physics. So we have the standard model. It's this group of particles that describes everything we see, right? It describes all of the matter in our bodies, and it describes all the interactions that thus far we have seen in our detectors when we collide two particles together and watch them interact and produce other stuff, right? It works exquisitely well for, for predicting all of the properties of collisions we observe in the LHC. Um, but the issue is that when we look in the night sky and measure the properties of stuff like the rotations of galaxies and you know how like the different bodies interact with each other through gravity in the universe we see that there's all of this other stuff that's pulling on the matter we can't see yeah but we can't detect it through any of our telescopes yeah anything that's sensitive yeah. to you know like we producing see it, you can't you can't it doesn't produce photons yeah. right yeah. it doesn't radiate and produce yeah. photons that we can detect with a telescope and we cannot hear it either yes like it's there is we know there is something because mm -hmm. of the computations basically yeah it's, we know there's something yeah. because we can watch it pulling on other stuff via gravity yeah. but we have because otherwise basically i think i remember it was kind of discovered because the computations show that um, the matter in the universe that we know, the yeah. matter yeah, yeah. that we know, should be uh, be pulled out much 
faster than it is to pull out right now. Yeah, uh, exactly. Because of the expansion of the universe, right? Well, so the first evidence for dark matter came from galaxies. Okay. So what happened is we looked at how quickly all of the matter in galaxies is rotating about the center of the galaxy. Yeah. Right. And we did some math. And we realize that if the galaxy was only composed of the stuff we could see, mm -hmm. it would fly apart. Yeah. yeah. It was spinning too quickly. Yeah. So right? something is like... So something pulling. else is yeah. there that's holding it together. Yeah. That's like kind of acting like glue. That's yeah. interact. That's pulling on it through gravity, right? Yeah. The issue is we can't see it. Yeah. It doesn't produce visible... It doesn't produce anything in the form of uh, electromagnetic radiation mm -hmm. that we can yeah. detect. We just know it's matter. We so just know it's what, like, something. It's matter because it interacts with uh, gravity. But yeah. basically, that's all we know. For exactly. Now. Yeah. And you can like do calculations about how much of this dark stuff there is compared to the stuff we can actually can see. And it turns out there's way more dark stuff. Yeah. Most of the universe is this, yeah. right? It's not, you know, the stuff that you and me and the stars and the, the planets are made out of. It's dark matter. Yeah. Right. And we have no idea what it is. Yeah. Um, we've is. never seen it in our collider. Yeah. Um, we might have produced it, but we, we've never seen it. We've yeah. never like been able to make a claim yeah. using some statistical model that mm -hmm. it's likely that we've produced dark matter. We, mm -hmm. We've only come up empty. We've only been able to say like, actually, and it's most probable that the standard model accounts for all of the results that we see in our yeah, 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 yeah. right? It's like, it doesn't interact with us, so it's mm -hmm. extremely hard to study for now. Yeah, right. Um, so, you know, there's, a lot of ideas for how we can go about detecting yeah. dark matter. Um, one of them is by making it a collider. Mm -hmm. There's also ideas for doing direct detection, right? Yeah. We know it exists in the universe, so let's just try to like detect it as it interacts with regular matter. Um, it's unclear whether or not it actually does interact with regular matter, but if it does, even very faintly, we could try to measure that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's called direct detection. And then there's all sorts of other people who are interested in studying it, you know, by measure, like, like modeling it and how it, um, you know, pulls on galaxies and using that to be yeah. able to like exclude what it might be, what it can be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So th there's a whole lot of ways we've been trying to tug at it. And I, I think it's one of these days, I really hope something's <laughs> going to be able to say something concrete about what it is. But thus far, we really just don't know. So you were um, saying that um, your somewhat optimistic about dark matter uh, yeah. um, and trying to have a better understanding of this before you die. Yeah, I hope uh, so. And so I'm curious why, because we talked about it and it seems like it's something we know it's out there, but we kind of have no clue about what it is. So yeah. what makes you um, optimistic about that? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So. There is a scenario in which we will likely not learn anything new about dark matter in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. And that scenario would be if dark matter only interacts through gravity. Mm -hmm. right? In this case, because gravity is such a weak force, yeah. it's pretty hard to see how we would get some handle on dark matter, at least in like a very direct way where we actually like know, can measure properties of whatever the stuff that makes dark matter is. Yeah. Um, I hope this isn't the case. That would be really sad. Now, people sometimes call this the nightmare scenario, like, you know, the case where dark matter is only gravitational. And, yeah. and then it's, it's really hard for us to figure out how it, how it actually um, would work. But there's hope here. So all of the particles that we know of, right, um, all of the fundamental particles that we know of derive their mass through the Higgs, right? They interact with the Higgs field, and that's how they get their mass. And so there's no reason to suspect that dark matter might not do this too it might derive its mass from interaction with the Higgs particle. And if it does that, then the Higgs particle should interact with it. That's one of the reasons the Higgs is so very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, now, a lot of the properties of the Higgs have not been measured yet. Um, and the reason is that the Higgs are very rare. They take forever to make. And a lot of times, the couplings between the Higgs and other particles can be quite small. So you need to make a lot of Higgs bosons in order to measure some of these very detailed properties. And we just haven't done that yet. We don't have the stats in all of our analyses to understand what, how exactly the Higgs behaves and all of these different possible ways it can decay and interact with other particles, right? Um, we don't have it yet, but we will. So in future runs of the LHC, that's in runs four and runs five, we're going to increase the size of our data sets by a factor of 10, mm -hmm. right? So we're gonna go from a few inverse femtobarns of data a few hundred inverse femtobarns of data to a few addo barns of data. So that's that's an order of magnitude increase. 
And the hope is when we do this, we can measure Higgs properties really, really accurately. And if there's any deviation, that could be a sign that dark matter is interacting with the Higgs field. It's mm -hmm. one thing that we could hope to measure. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you know these sorts of precision Higgs measurements and precision measurements of other things within the standard model, like how the Higgs interacts with top quarks, how the Higgs interacts with B quarks and leptons and tiles, like those things could show the way. They they could offer some suggestion for what dark matter might be, right? Mm. Um, yeah, because that way, if dark matter interacts with the Higgs and not only with gravity, that means we could start and study it here, uh, the LHC, yeah. because, well, then it's somewhat easier, because if you only rely on gravity, then you just need an incredible amount of energy to to basically simulate what's, what's happening with, with gravity because it's just so, so weak. Yeah, right. So we neglect gravity in all the experiments we do at the LHC. Yeah. We just pretend like it doesn't exist yeah. because it's so weak compared to the other forces, yeah. right? And if dark matter is only interacting through gravity, there's no way that we could like measure its effects on LHC collisions because it just gets totally washed yeah. out. You would have to create what you would have to create a black hole to, yeah. to, to get so much gravity that it finally interacts with. Yeah, uh, exactly. So matter. this is on this is unknown territory, right? We yeah. don't have a good theory of quantum gravity, so we yeah. really yeah. don't know what we would need to do to mm -hmm. like actually make gravitons at the LHC. These yeah. are the hypothetical particles that carry the force of gravity. Mm -hmm. You know, um, like the photon carries the force of electromagnetism, and the gluons carry the strong force, and the W and Z bosons carry the weak. There should be some graviton that carries the gravitational force, but we have no idea what that might be. Like, yeah, yeah. It's unclear whether the th properties we expect it to have would actually exist, and it's unclear what we need to do to actually make it at the LHC, uh, because we don't have a good theory of quantum gravity. We just don't know. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and we would need an unbelievable amount of energy in order to enter the regime where quantum gravity would become like a thing that would have real effects on the on the particles that come out of the collision. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, you would basically need a black hole, as yeah. I understand it. <laughs> you know, I, I'm not a theorist. I'm not someone that thinks about these like questions of gravity and quantum mechanics. Um, but yeah, as I understand it, that's just something that's not really reachable to us in terrestrial experience, yeah. like collider physics. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, without being able to measure how dark matter couples to gravity directly um, or you know being able to like try to get at its mass or its particle nature through the gravitational interactions we can only hope that it interacts with other standard model particles and the best candidate is going to be the higgs yeah, yeah. Um, and that's why the higgs is really a portal to looking beyond the standard model. Yeah. Um, that's why we're so interested in it. It wasn't just the fact that we found the last piece of the standard model. It's that this piece in particular might give us an idea for what comes next. Mm -hmm. um, at least that's the hope. And, and that's my biggest hope for why I think I might learn something new about the universe before in the next 20 to 30 years. It's like, what's going to come out of the HL of HC data sets? I think it's a really, really exciting time. Um, as soon as we get that data and, and you know just increase our stats by a factor by, by a lot, um, I hope to see something new come out. Now, there's a chance it doesn't happen, right? <laughs> so there's always a chance that you know we know there's new physics out there, but we're just not doing the right thing in order to find it. And if that's the case, um, the next thing to look to is a new collider um, and. Currently, the community is trying to figure out what our strategy for the collider after the LHC should be. Um, and there are a lot of ideas. So one of the big ones is what's called the FCC. Mm -hmm. um, the FCC stands for Future Circular Collider. It is the next collider that would be hosted here at CERN. Mm -hmm. And it would be um, a blown up version of the LHC. Mm -hmm. So the LHC is currently in an um, underground tunnel that has a 13 kilometer circumference we would increase that to a hundred kilometer circumference. Mm -hmm. So that would encircle the entire city of Geneva, yeah. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. It would go all, it would go under Lake Geneva, um, all the way around some of the mountains towards the Alps and then yeah. like back. Um, so it'd be an enormous machine. Yeah. Um, and the plan would be to start that machine by colliding electrons and positrons. Um, um, this is a different type of collider that lets you do really precision studies of, um, you know, what happens when you take an electron and positron and collide them. Um, 
that machine would essentially give us like a really, really fine and detailed understanding of the Higgs and all its interactions. It, it kind of shares the same goal as the high luminosity runs of the LHC, but it would be a lot better. Uh -huh. um, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's something called a Higgs factory, is how people often refer to it. Just anything that makes a lot of Higgs bosons mm -hmm. and produces them in clean environments so we can study them with really fine detail. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, and then after the electron positron runs of that machine, we would go to a uh, proton proton collider, just like the LHC. And that would be the current plans have that operating at a uh, collision energy of 100 TeV. Mm -hmm. So the LHC is about 14 TeV. This would be 100, so it's an order of magnitude increase. Yeah. Yeah. And then the hope is with all that extra energy, we could produce a new particle, right? Um, if there is a new particle that is accessible by, an, uh, by a machine with that much energy, we should be able to see it. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so it, if we don't learn something new through precision measurements, maybe we'll learn something new by just putting more energy in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm going to be old by the time the FCC starts colliding things at 100 TeV, yeah. but I hope that maybe, maybe um, something new would come out of that machine. And if it doesn't, you know, this is always the thing. Like, you can't know that you're going to find something in science. Yeah. Um, but you, you cannot know either that you're not going to find something in yeah. something you didn't at all, um, you know, think about before. Yeah, and that, that's the thing that really excites me, right? Yeah. Like, what if, what if it's not like, like some deviation from the date of the data from theory that we find, like some subtle thing in one of the Higgs couplings that suggests new physics? Yeah. Or maybe, you know, and maybe it's not even, you know, that, that would be one thing that would be exciting. Another thing that would be exciting is if we found, like, a new particle that people expected, that someone had predicted, like yeah. a supersymmetric particle, right? Yeah, yeah, this yeah. supersymmetry is the idea that a lot of theorists really like about how you could extend the standard model to um, account for various problems that they see with it and also like come up with an explanation of dark matter. Mm -hmm. um, it's a theory that's been thrown around a lot and received a lot of attention. A lot of people still look for supersymmetry at the LHC. So you could imagine that maybe when we turn on the FCC at 100 TeV collision energy, and maybe a super symmetric particle would come out. That would also be awesome. That would make me so excited. Yeah. But the thing that would be like beyond cool is if we found something that no one had thought about, mm -hmm. like something that doesn't even make any sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like something that's just like a total deviation from what anyone had expected. Yeah. That would be um, that would be the dream. Yeah. Right. That'd <laughs> that, be the best for sure. That would be the best. Um, yeah. We can only hope though. Um, that's the exciting part about science, I think. There's a lot of risk involved yeah, in, in sure. nearly every decision you make. You know, there's one, a risk in like even thinking that we can hope to measure something about the universe that's new to begin with, mm -hmm. right? If dark matter only interacts gravitationally, we won't see it in these collider experiments. And so there's a lot of risk in trying to do them to try to answer this question. Like, there's a chance that it just won't work. Um, and that would be sad, but you know, it's the price you pay for discovery. Yeah. Um, you know, you need to be able to take these risks. It was 2009 and I was opening for NAS. Predicted they would love us. Hypothesis was wrong. Crowd presented evidence booing while I rhymed. They'd rather hear the message or New York state of mind. Was it my flow? No, I hardly lacked ability. Rapping with agility. Check the probability. Not likely to give up under fierce choleric scrutiny refused to stop the show though their peer review was news to me confusing me like the anti-science right i was dripping like the ice caps yes it was not my night but i kept it busy in because the late i'm in is solid anticipate results with my a priori knowledge so never let a hater shower you with data that tells you you should quit Drive as you can see there's a lot of computers here mm -hmm. um, and this is just one of the sites spread around the world that have the task of processing data that comes off of the experiments at the LHC. So that includes Atlas, CMS, LEAS, and LHCB. Um, yeah, so you can kind of see that they've labeled what each of the, the racks here is for. Yeah. Anything that's labeled worldwide LHC computing grid, mm -hmm. that is wired into this whole network of computers spread everywhere around the globe that has the role of processing um, all of the data that comes off of the collider. And it is a lot of data. The LHC produces like many, many terabytes of data. 
And one of the ongoing challenges that we're trying to overcome is how to make all of that data fit on all of our storage systems, right? Um, you would think that maybe we could just go to any store and buy some solid state drives and it'd be fine, but we do not have the, you know, it, it, there's just so much data that we need to like have computing centers like this and really think about how we're going to fit all of our data onto the storage that we do have within our budget. Um, otherwise, you know, we'd end up not being able to process it, which would turn into not being able to make to learn new things about the universe. One of the first web servers in the world. Um, this was maybe one of the computer terminals that Tim Berners-Lee used to create the first version of the World Wide Web, which is kind of cool. Um, I th over here, there's some storage devices. So these are cartridges of magnetic tape. Um, you can see it's a kind of like the spool of this black tape that you can use to write data on. Mm -hmm. And this kind of technology is actually still in use. We still use this to write data um, <laughs> for the LHC. Um, this is an old sample. Nowadays, the tape that we use is a lot more higher density, so you can put a lot more data on it. But it's still kind of like the workhorse method we have for long-term data storage. Um, reason being is I think it's cost effective and it's also very stable. So it's, you know, it, it takes longer to read out than like a solid state drive would be, but um, there's less chance of it getting corrupted and also it's not as expensive as SSDs. Yeah. Um, so we still do use it. Um, and it's actually kind of cool, like there are automated systems that people have developed for managing this magnetic tape. So this is an old sample of like, um, there's these spools that you would wind magnetic tape around um, and you would store them in these honey honeycomb-like um, patterns. Yeah. And actually, people, there are robots that like have little robotic arms that would come through, select the data that you need, and then put it in the reader to be read out if they wanted to analyze it. And this still exists. Um, there are a lot of computing centers around the world where there will be big vaults where you have large spools of magnetic tape and little robot arms that are going through and selecting the tape off the shelf and putting it in a reader for someone to analyze. Um, yeah, so that, that exists here. Um, it also exists in other competing sites around the world. Um, yeah, so that's what kind of our data storage devices look like. Um, over here, you have some early examples of CPUs, just to give you an idea of what processing unit used to look like. Um, this is from the 80s and 90s. So I guess each of these is a, each of these little squares is a um, CPU. Mm -hmm. And this kind of cover thing has these little adjustable pinions that sit on top and do the cooling for yeah. the computing unit. Um, obviously, all of the chips in this pattern here um, have a tiny, tiny fraction of the computing power that's in your cell phone. Yeah. Um, right? <laughs> so this is old technology, but it gives you an idea of what like the first silicon computing units used to look like. We've obviously come a very long way, um, but it's pretty interesting to look back at all the history. Um, yeah, this right here is kind of a cool thing. This is magnetic core memory. So this is what RAM used to look like. It's like this mesh. And I'm going to be honest, I don't understand the principle behind how this mesh is actually used to store <laughs> memory. But um, the person who you know, gave me the tour of this said that this is actually a very special artifact. Like, it's one of one. Like, there's not many samples of this type of computer memory left in the world. Hmm. Um, yeah, so he said, be very careful with it. <laughs> don't let people try to walk off with it. Um, yeah. Yeah, and then over here, these are very cool. These are hard disks, right? So in addition to magnetic tape, we also use hard disks to store LHC data. Um, so hard disks are similar to what you might have in an old fashioned computer, yeah. right? Oh yeah, I've An example of what would be here, yeah. yeah. So there's this tiny little disk that you can use to write data on, and it spins and is read out by this mechanical arm. Um, yeah, so this is something that you might see 
for sale at any consumer electronics store. Yeah. Something not so different. Nowadays, we tend to sell mostly uh, SSDs, but yeah. um, hard disks, I think you can still buy them. Um, and then this is the industrial version, <laughs> right? It's a huge, huge thing. Um, I don't know when this is actually from. Let's see, does it, does it say on here? Um, yeah, 1974. 1974, yeah. So you can manage what the data storage on this would be. Maybe a, a few megabytes, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> a few kilobytes, not sure. It 10 say. megabytes. 10 yeah. megabytes. So, yeah, it's really small. Yeah, yeah. So you might be able to, like, put a few songs on this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. Uh, about, uh, yeah, it's, it's like a... It's like a, a get get a stack of these and you have the same yeah. storage capacity as like an iPod. <laughs> yeah. And in comparison, the hard drive we just saw was two terabytes. <laughs> yeah, two terabytes here. Uh, yeah. So it gives you an idea of the progress is we've made in 30, yeah. 40 years of engineering. Exactly. Uh, yeah. And this so um, this is less than 150 Swiss francs. Yeah. Um, is the idea here. And <clears throat> this stack of disks here is kind of an intermediate version. Um, this is from 1991. It was 30, it stores 34 gigabytes. Mm -hmm. So less than what this tiny little consumer unit can store. And it cost 100,000 Swiss francs. Yeah. So this was state of the art in 1991. Um, and this is like basic consumer electronics today. And it has, you know, a large, a factor of 10 increase in storage nearly, so. Um, yeah, we've come a long way. <laughs> yeah. And yet, despite all that progress, we still have issues with the amount of data we have <laughs> and how much we need to store it. Yeah. Um, and it's mainly like a space issue, basically, right? Yep, that's exactly it. Um, we need to buy a lot of magnetic tape yeah. and just keep writing data on it, but there's only so much budget to do this. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, there's, there's these plots that people show of like, here's how much data we're going to produce in future runs of the LHC. And you see like a stark, stark increase because yeah. we're pr triggering because we're triggering so many more yeah, collisions, yeah, yeah. right? We have so many more events to process. Um, mm. So you see an increase when we yeah. hit the high luminosity runs, and you see the amount of storage that we'll be able to buy, yeah. right? And you see that like the two lines, I mean, they're nearly keeping up, but yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. tight. So it's a problem that we have. And, and do you get rid of some data at some point, like the old data? What do you do with it? So no. We have never deleted any collection data, um, to my knowledge. Um, so we still have all of the data from every run of the IHC that's been conducted. That includes run one, when we were running at 6.8 TeV, so a, a lower beam energy, right? And that's all of run two, all of the run three data that's been taken now, and hopefully all of the high luminosity runs in the future. We've never deleted anything, to my knowledge. Um, and hopefully we'll never have, <laughs> we'll never have to do that. Because um, it's very valuable. Even the run one data is still used to do physics. Um, yeah. Um, now, the, the other thing is that in addition to all of the data that we take with the detector, we have a lot of data that's generated through uh, simulation. So simulation is actually a big part of what we do at the LHC. Um, without, uh, and essentially it boils down to the same issue that we had with why we can only make statistical claims about physics and never like you know, really simple claims like we saw Higgs boson, right? It's because we don't actually observe what we're interested in. We only observe like the remnants. And so in order to compare the data to theory, mm -hmm. you actually need to simulate the theory first, mm -hmm. pass it through a big detailed simulation of the detector to figure out what you should see if the standard model is correct. Mm -hmm. And then you kind of have like a thing to compare against, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we do a lot of this. Um, yeah, just about every analysis of data that we do here will depend on simulation in some capacity. And so simulation is a really important thing, and we make a lot of simulated data too. So it's not just the data that we take from the detector that we need to store, it's also the simulation. Yeah. Now simulation we delete all the time, right? Because yeah. it's, yeah. Not, it's not the physical data that tells us how the universe works. It's just like the thing we compare against. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so this gets del deleted a lot. Um, but the data itself, that's very precious. We hold on to that. Yeah. 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 Um, maybe the last thing I should say about all of this is that a lot of these computers, it's not just made for storing data and running all the, repro the reconstruction algorithms and analysis code and whatever. It's also used for generating simulated data. That is a very computationally expensive task. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. 
there are all sorts of software packages that people have written that simulate what happens when you pass particles through a detector. Right? Yeah. And we need to run these programs, but they take a lot of computational resources and memory and all of these things. And so many of the computers you see in front of you, they're not actually processing data that comes off the machine or anything like this. They're just running simulations. Yeah. And they're, they're doing this so that we have, again, something to compare our actual data again. Sound like I was still a baby when I first learned to be a Bayesian. I would find myself within a constant state of frustration for the day begins. On Facebook, my sample consisted of people I called my friends who self-aggrandized and post constantly aligned with the latest trends. Using inconclusive evidence to assess the probability that people would never examine what is true and accept the lie willingly. From my observation came a question, are people really so naive? Or is there a correlation between make-believe and what is on the screen? Cause it seems that we have forgotten this The truth and politics are opposites Humans are intelligent And that's the layup of the hypothesis So I would conduct an experiment by laying down a... So this is the antimatter factory you told That's me. right um, The proper name for it is the anti-proton decelerator Yeah So the idea behind this whole experimental hole is that we make antiprotons by taking a proton beam and smacking it into a wall, basically. It's a beryllium target, but could be anything. And that will produce antiprotons. And then we capture these antiprotons. And instead of doing the usual thing, like what we do in the LHC, where you accelerate the protons and put more energy into them, we decelerate the protons. And the reason you do this is you, you want to take antimatter and slow it down so that you can study its properties in very fine detail using all of these small scale, scale experiments, right? So this is a totally different world than collider physics. We're not interested in things at high energy. We want to slow things down mm -hmm. with the idea that we can measure their properties with a lot of precision. Um, so what we're standing on top of right now is the AD, the anti-proton decelerator. It's a beam line in the shape of an oval, much like the LHC, um, that slows down the protons, the anti-protons, right? Um, and it will take them down to an energy of a few keV, I believe. I'd have to look it up, but it, it slows them down to an energy that's like quite small compared to what they're produced at. Um, and then the beam from this machine is actually further injected into this other storage ring named Elena, which you see here. So if you turn around, this is Elena. Um, and since the protons, anti-protons are at such low energy, we actually don't even need to shield the beam line. It can just be out in the open, and which hmm. is quite cool because you can see it. And you yeah. can see exactly what a beam line is made out of. Um, so, all of these orange units that you see here, these are different magnets that are used for focusing the beam as it travels around the ring. Yeah. These blue units are used for cooling the beam. Um, that is this method of taking the beam and making sure it is more compact and all of the anti-protons in it have like a uniform energy. The RF is number four, which you see there. Okay, so that's the RF cavity. So that thing has the job of actually applying an electric field to all the antiprotons that slows them down. So in the LHC, it's the exact same technology, but pointed in the other direction. There's an electric field that's applied that speeds the protons up. Here we turn it around and we use it to slow the antiprotons down. Um, so this ring is very cool. It will take the antiprotons down to a very, very small energy. Um, I believe Elena goes down to, let's see, 0.1 mega electron volt, which is a very small energy for a proton. Um, the proton rest mass is 938 MeV, mega electron volts. So we're starting to get into the regime and the storage ring where the protons aren't even relativistic. Um, most of their energy is contained in the rest mass. It's not in their kinetic energy. Yeah. Um, so they're still moving at a good fraction of the speed of light, but only a fraction of, not at most of the speed of light, like the protons in the LHC. And when you get antiprotons down to this energy, they, you can do all sorts of interesting physics. So this storage ring will take the antiprotons and shoot them into all these experiments that surround it. So you can see some of the injection lines spurting off 
from the storage ring. They're here and here. And this is what they use to deliver the anti-protons to the experiments around. I think this is a really cool thing because it gives people like a, you know, the LHC is just this, but scaled up a thousand times. Yeah. You just make a much bigger circle and you turn the RF cavities around. Beyond that, it's the same principle. Huh. Yeah. yeah, that's really cool to really see it in the open like that. Yeah, exactly. And like see it in one go, right? And the yeah, LHC, yeah, yeah. there's a big long pipe, but you can't, you can't get an idea of how the entire machine works. Here you can really see all the different components and how yeah. they work together. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And maybe uh, quickly, can you tell us, so basically this is made to study antimatter. Uh, yeah. Can you guess what the biggest question is right now regarding antimatter that uh, they're trying to decipher here in these experiments? There are a few things that experiments in this hall are trying to figure out. One of the biggest ones is how antimatter interacts with gravity, right? We can study how antimatter interacts with any of the other forces with great precision in collider experiments. We do it every day at the LHC. Gravity, however, remember, we ignore in collider physics because yeah. it's so weak. Yeah. Now, if we can take antimatter and lower its energy such that, and then put it in an environment where it won't feel any of the other forces, right? So there's no electromagnetic interactions going on, the strong interactions, you know, they're, they're still holding the antimatter together, but it's not interacting strongly with anything around it. And the same thing for the weak interactions. If you put it in that environment, the only thing left is gravity. And so any forces that are acting upon the antimatter are due to gravity, right? Um, and so one of the, some of the experiments here are measuring how antimatter interacts with gravity and seeing if there's any deviation between how antimatter versus regular matter interact. Because for now, we don't know what and if antimatter interacts with gravity. Yeah. We know it, we know it interacts with the other forces, but we don't know if it interacts with gravity. So it definitely does interact with gravity. Yeah. We know uh, that. Okay. Um, whether or not it interacts in exactly the same way is still not precisely known. The same way as traditional matter. Traditional matter. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So this is something that's kind of curious, though, about physics. You can always say with some precision that inter antimatter seems to interact in the same way as does regular matter, right? But you can always shrink your error bars, right? There are always, there's always some error on the measurements that we make. Yeah. And we can always measure things with more accuracy. Yeah. And you can always say that, well, new physics isn't producing some deviation between these interactions at this level of precision. But if I measure things more finely, then maybe there is some deviation, right? Um, oftentimes, new physics begins with the next decimal of precision. And that's what a lot of these experiments are trying to do. They're trying to measure things down and down and down to like really, really fine precision. And if you can do that, there's a hope that you'll see some fine deviation. Ah, uh, okay. So yeah, you may have heard about the muon G minus two experiments. This no. made news a few years ago oh, yeah. when they measured a particular property of the muon with really high precision and found it deviated from the standard model value, right? Um, the deviation was on the level of 4.2 sigma. So it didn't rise to like the gold standard of five sigma that we traditional call a discovery. So it's not totally clear that this is new physics, but it's a large deviation from the standard model predictions. And if it turns out that the measurement is solid, um, then, you know, that could be a sign of new physics. A lot of the experience, you know, if you talk to the people who work on experiments in here, their dream is that they'll produce some result like that. Some measurements where the standard model value and what they're measuring are just completely off, mm. right? And, if, you know, if we do that, then we've measured new physics. There's something going on, and that could predict, point the new way forward beyond the standard model. Yeah, because that would mean, like, basically we're trying to understand if anti-matter interacts differently with gravity than traditional matter does yeah and then what would be the implications of that if that's true if that's the case yeah that's a really good question um i don't know like i, I don't know what this would mean for our theoretical models I, I i know very little about quantum gravity and what theories we do have of it yeah but i suppose it would tell us that gravity is not respecting the symmetry that we see in nature between matter and antimatter. Oh, okay. Right. And, and then would that be related to the fact that at least in our, what, 
galaxy or even universe, we have, well, much more matter than antimatter, right? Exactly. It, yep. it seems like the universe has a preference for matter because otherwise, well, we would just have blown up everything. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, so this is a huge, huge open problem in particle physics. And one of the other ones that if you talk to people around here, might you might get, if you ask them, like, what question do you hope to answer before you die? This is another one you might get answered. Yeah, like, yeah. why is there so much more matter in the universe? Yeah. Because the amazing thing is that in the LHC, whenever we smack protons together, we produce matter, we produce antimatter, but it's always in exactly the same amounts. Huh. One to one. Like, huh. with okay. an incredible amount of precision. Okay. It is, it is, like, you know, nearly right on. And, you know, there's, again, there's always some error bar on our measurements. We yeah, can't yeah. say it's exactly one-to-one. -one. It's one-to-one -one yeah. with some precision. Yeah, yeah. But all of our measurements are just one-to-one, -one, right? Mm. But when you look in the universe, it's not one-to-one. Yeah. -one yeah exactly. By any stretch of the imagination. Mm. And so it's totally unclear what's going on. Like, why can, why do all of the processes that we measure in the LHC produce one-to-one -one ratio when clearly in the Big Bang, the stuff that made everything that we see around us it was not even close to one-to-one, -one, yeah. right? And if one of these experiments measured that there's some deviation between how gravity interacts with matter versus antimatter, I mean, yeah, that's like right. a huge yeah. signal that gravity is treating matter and antimatter differently. Yeah. And that would suggest that ultimately the reason for the asymmetry we've seen between matter and antimatter might lie in the gravitational interactions. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. so that would definitely be a huge step forward in yeah. To understanding, yes. starting to understand why the universe is asymmetrical. It would be a uh, big discovery. In, yeah. It would, uh, in antimatter versus traditional matter. Yeah, that's uh, right. Yeah. And, you know, they've done measurements of these interactions, and so far they've turned up nothing. Yeah. But yeah. physics, you can always go to the next decimal. Yeah, yeah. Right? Sure. You can always go to the next decimal. And there's nothing. there's no reason why the next decimal shouldn't tell you something new. So yeah, yeah. You, you always, there's always this game of trying to shrink your error bars small as you possibly can. This device, it's called a pad, personal access device, is exactly what you use to go into the LHC. Um, so if I was going down into the Atlas Cavern, I would have to scan my dosimeter here. Then this door would open up and I'd like climb in this tube device. Um, and then on the right side here, there's actually a retinal scanner, which is kind of cool. So it's very like fancy and high tech. It actually takes a picture of your eyes to verify that it's you. And then if everything's okay and the person is who they say they are, then the door on the other side will open and they can pass through. This is what you use to go into any area that can have a lot of radiation at CERN. This is a presentation for a few of the other experiments hosted in the anti-proton decelerator. Um, alpha bar. So this one is looking to measure the hyperfine structure of the anti-hydrogen atom. And hydrogen, the electron, has a bunch of different energy states that it can occupy. And this energy spectrum, like the, the distribution of the energies of all the different states it can occupy, has like a lot of structure to it. So you can, you know, a classic like calculation that you do in undergraduate quantum mechanics is calculate like the principal energy levels from the within the hydrogen atom but in fact those that calculation makes some simplifying assumptions right and if you start including more and more like small effects within the hydrogen atom you get a better and better model for the energy spectrum right and we can do these calculations with exquisite precision these days like we can totally account for the energy spectrum of hydrogen it makes total sense but we haven't really measured the anti-hydrogen spectrum with a lot of precision. And so that's what this experiment is trying to do. Measure all the different um, energy levels of anti-hydrogen and make sure that they align with hydrogen because they should. If the standard model is the end of the story, then we should see that the hydrogen and anti-hydrogen spectra are exactly the same. Um, and so this experiment is trying to verify that. One question that popped into my mind is that, so you said that there is a one-to-one -one ratio of creation of matter and antimatter in the, the LHC. That's right. Uh, so then my question is, why is it so hard to create antimatter? Because uh, if you can do that somewhat easily in the LHC, why is that known to be extremely hard to produce antimatter? 
Yeah. So the honest answer is it's not that hard to make antimatter. Mm -hmm. So antimatter kind of occurs around us all the time and we just tend not to notice it because mm -hmm. it lives for a very brief short of time between finding some matter and annihilating. Right. Mm -hmm. So the antimatter that exists in nature comes from cosmic rays. Mm -hmm. Right. So anytime you have some charged particle or energetic photon that smacks into our atmosphere that come from all these different sources in outer, outer space, you have some very high energy collisions and those collisions produce antimatter. Like without a doubt, they will. And that can be in the form of, you know, anti uh, positrons, that can be in the form of um, anti muons, that can be in the form of anti quarks, of mesons that actually contain antimatter within them. Uh, mesons are bound states of a quark and an anti quark. Um, so, yeah, antimatter exists all around us. It's just that it almost li it lives for a very short time before it goes away. Okay. So, the reason why this whole facility exists is not so much that it's like hard to make antimatter, but it's hard to hang on to it. Yeah. Okay. Right? Yeah. So that's why we have all these storage rains that have like mm -hmm. all of the air evacuated out of them, right? They're vacuum sealed. Yeah. yeah. And then um, they have all these magnetic and electric fields that are designed to keep the antimatter trapped. Yeah. So it stays away from all the matter around it. Yeah. And you can hold on to it, it for a long time. Annihilate. Okay. Right. So it's not how to produce it, it's, not, it's how to hang on to it. It's hard to hang on to. Uh, exactly. Yeah, that's right. Um, so yeah, antimatter gets produced all the time, um, and the, the really tricky thing is hanging on to it. So Kevin, thanks a lot for taking so much time uh, in walking us through the whole campus and talking to us about all these amazing, uh, fascinating topics yeah, in your sure. personal work, in your, in your PhD. Before letting you go, though, I have to ask you the last two questions I ask oh. every guest Ooh, in great. the show. So, First question, if you had unlimited time and resources, which problem would you try to solve? Oh, boy, <laughs> this is a hard one. Unlimited yeah. time and resources. <sighs> yeah. You know, I think the problem that I would try to solve is pretty similar to the problem I'm currently trying to solve. Mm -hmm. um, I think I want to know what the nature of dark matter is. Mm -hmm. um, this is the problem that I think I have the most chance of finding, learning the answer to before before I before on a reasonable time scale, right? Mm -hmm. I, I think we have the technology to do it. I think it's possible. Um, I just think you know it 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 takes a lot, right? So if I had a limited time and resources, that's what I would do. The way I would do it is maybe a more interesting question. I, I think this is something I don't quite know the answer to. <laughs> um, um, I think collider physics is a lot to say about the search for dark matter. I think this is probably the best tool we have at the moment for understanding um, dark matter, just because we can understand how it might interact with other exotic particles in the standard model. Um, but um, I think the tool that we need to do that is probably going to be some sort of future collider. Um, you know, if the LHC doesn't turn anything up in future runs, mm -hmm. then I want to see there be another collider that is yeah. built. Um, and so if I have unlimited time and resources, what I would do is I would make sure that project is funded. I want to make sure that all the accelerator physicists that have new ideas for how to make a new collider, these are things like really strong superconducting magnets that can bend beams with like incredible strength. These are things like uh, new ideas like muon colliders, where mm -hmm. instead of colliding protons and, and, or electrons and positrons, as we usually do, we collide muons, mm -hmm. um, which are a heavier particle, and they, they have some benefits in, the, uh, in a number of ways. <laughs> Um, and I would make sure that anyone who wants to work uh, on designing like next generation detectors that can reconstruct the properties of our collisions with incredible precision, I, I would make sure this would happen. Um, I would, you know, make sure we have all the computing resources we need to generate all of our simulations to, to train all of our networks to analyze our collision data. Yeah, I, w I personally, I would just, I would just fund what uh, the kind of physics I do. I would make sure that we have everything necessary to continue asking these questions. Um, I think it's really important. Um, and if I, if, if I had infinite resources, that's what I would do with it. Um, can only hope that we have the resources that we need going forward. I, but yeah. I, I think, I think we, we have the ability. Um, we just need the chance. Yeah. Well, that sounds like fun. <laughs> yeah. Um, and second question, if you could have dinner with any great scientific mind, dead, alive, or fictional, wow. who would it be? 
Oh gosh, there are so many. <laughs> oh gosh, um, it's so hard to pick one. I think I would choose Boltzmann. Mm -hmm. um, Boltzmann because um, <laughs> I think his contributions to our understanding of the universe are underappreciated. Um, he is someone that's not a household name, not like Einstein, not like Feynman, but um, he was the first person to apply probabilistic reasoning to physics mm -hmm. and realize that outside of just making deterministic predictions based on, you know, Newton's laws of motion, we could use probabilistic principles to make predictions about systems with many, many degrees of freedom. Mm -hmm. I think that was a pretty extraordinary step in our understanding of how to model the universe. And um, beyond that, I think he was also just an interesting character. Um, and so I, I would love a chance to talk with him. I, I really admire his work and I think, yeah, his, his contributions to the field are kind of underappreciated. Um, deserves to be a household name, but he is not. So, so that's my answer. Um, but yeah, I, I guess yeah. you're only going to give me one, so <laughs> I, can, I should stop yeah, talking now. Yeah, I mean, that's perfect. Yeah. Uh, and what an extremely appropriate um, choice for the for these podcasts. So absolutely that's, that's perfect. Yeah. yeah, the power of probabilistic modeling. Exactly. Yet again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, perfect. Thanks a lot, Kevin, for um, taking the time. And uh, as usual. I put resources in the show notes to your to your website, to your socials, and uh, like any link that you find relevant, that whether it's books or videos or uh, comic books, or, <laughs> you know, like yeah. anything you think it would be useful for people who want to dig deeper, okay. we'll put that in the show notes. And uh, on that note, thanks a lot, Kevin, for taking the time and being on this show. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. It's been a joy. Well, that's it. My dear Bayesians, I hope you enjoyed this deep dive into all things physics. If you have any recommendations of other cool scientific places I should go do a documentary about, please get in touch on Twitter at LearnBaseStats or by email. This was literally a one person and never. You may have noticed that I edited the video myself. Uh, so, if you liked it, please consider supporting the show on Patreon. For you, it's literally cheaper than one cafe latte per month. For the show, it means a lot. It means I'll be able to keep doing such in-depth content. And maybe next time, I'll even be able to pay for a professional video editor, which we will all benefit from. I think we can all agree about that. So again, that's patreon.com slash learn base stats. Before letting you go, I have to thank once again Daniel Whiteson for the recommendation, Agustina Tassara for her GoPro assistance, and Kevin Grive for a fantastic visit. I'll see you in the next episode, my dear Bayesians, and in the meantime, best Bayesian wishes. Let me show you how to be a good Bayesian, change your predictions. After